Hello, I'm going to talk now uh, about cycles for animated feature film production. Uh, So my name is Stefan Werner. I'm a C++ developer. Most of the time, there's some Python thrown in, um, and maybe a bit new to Blender here. Uh, I've been working in the 3D industry for over 15 years. I was one of the core developers on Poser for many, many years. Um, developed a whole bunch of render features um, that were quite en vogue at the time. And in 2015, I started building a path tracer for uh, Poser. And we decided to actually end up using Cycles and integrating it into Poser, um, which was a good experience with it. And it started submitting bug fixes. And just in the beginning of this year, I started working as a freelancer. And my current job is um, improving Cycles for Tangent Animation. So Tangent Animation, if you have been here last year, um, just show of hands, who has seen the talk uh, making Aussie with Blender last year? Okay, so the rest of you can catch up on YouTube. It's recorded. <laughs> um, but basically, uh, they can give a better introduction of tangent animation than I possibly could, so I'm not going to try. Um, but just in a nutshell, tangent animation is an animation studio in Canada. It's going to be around 150 people, I cannot say exactly. And they're doing feature film production using Blender. Um, the first feature they released is called Ozzy, and it made it to theaters. Um, in several countries last, or, yeah, last year. Um, currently in production is a movie called Next Gen. Um, it has a budget of $30 million and is scheduled to be released next year. Um, I know you're all excited to see something of it. I can tell you all about nothing. <laughs> I wish I could. I really wish I could show you anything about it, but uh, I just do not have permission. Um, next year, I'm sure. Um, no, instead, I'm going to talk about all the technical sites on the rendering uh, street. So um, if you've seen the talk from Francesco this morning, um, we're running in some of the same issues as they were running into uh, in, in the H 327. Um, what is the one thing that's always too long? Render time. As Francesco was always being asked, like, what is your render time? It's too long. It is always too long. Render time's too long. Your scenes are too big. You cannot render on a GPU, and you have over 100,000 frames to render. Each frame takes several hours, if not days. Um, so why is rendering so hard? Well, you have hundreds of millions of rays to trace per frame. You have hundreds of millions of triangles per frame. And the main cost is always finding out which ray of these millions hits which of the million triangles. And if you can make that faster, you have made rendering faster. Um, so that was basically my first job, was to make rendering faster. <laughs> so I look at who's, to, who's, who's better at this than I am. Um, it turns out there's a library out there that does ray tracing on a CPU, um, and it's highly optimized, and it's really good. It's called Embry, um, developed by people at Intel. They've published several papers about it. And it's completely open source. You know, we can use it. It supports triangles, quads, subdivision, displacements, and all the features you would want. And it's continuously being developed, so we get free bug fixes from it all the time. The only thing that's missing is GPU support, since it's Intel, I guess. <laughs> um, but anyway, that looked very promising, so I started integrating it into cycles. Um, and it's just used it as a drop-in replacement for what is already in Cycles for doing those intersections. Um, so it's supporting all the primitives that Cycles does. So there's triangles, there's the hair. Um, and subdivision and displacements are just treated the same way as they're treated in Cycles already. So they all turn to little triangles, and then we ray trace them. And the important part for production, um, as they had in the agent as well, motion blur is something you do not want to live without, and it's always very costly. So there was a, a few modifications to Embry, um, not very much, just to line up a few things. A um, couple hundred lines of cycles code. All you see in the end is just a little checkbox. <laughs> so how does it perform? Do we actually gain anything from all the work that I did? Um, first thing you run is the usual benchmark suite. You're all familiar with this. Uh, these are numbers from an early version run on a standard laptop. And well, some of them are actually slower. 
Some are faster, some are a lot faster, and the larger scenes also are faster. But I, I was talking about like, tens of gigabytes of, of stuff to render. Um, so how does it look like the bigger scenes? Oh, I skipped the memory. Um, memory is also doing roughly the same, sometimes better, sometimes worse, but let's move on to the big stuff, right? Agent. So the agent scenes, um, this is one of the stills, um, one of the more problematic ones from what I hear. Um, and just to zoom in on what the results were, um, this is not my laptop, this is a bigger machine. We're looking at render time of 14 minutes for a very noisy frame and about five and a half gigabytes of memory being used. Doing the same thing in Embry gives you what looks like the same result. Um, if you do a pixel by pixel comparison, you see there's some differences in the hair. But if I hadn't told you, you probably would not know that this is a different image. And there, well, we saved two minutes and memory went up a little. Now, this is for motion blur. Doing the same scene again with motion blur, which as you can see, there's not a lot of motion in there, right? This the head is moving a little, the curling iron is moving a little bit. It's not one of those extreme motion across the screen scenes, right? It's just a simple, simple little motion frame. So in standard cycles, this goes from 14 minutes to an hour. And your memory almost doubled with at least, what, three gigabytes more than before. Doing the same thing in cycles. It's the frame again. Rendering this in 14 minutes. Memory went also up, but not, not far. So 16 minutes to less than 15 minutes, nine gigabytes to six gigabytes. It's, it's four times faster using two thirds of the memory. Uh, so yeah, it turns out we can have both memory and speed. Um, now on next gen, uh, I'm not going to show you the frame, but I'm going to show you the render logs. Um, so the flat line here means uh, we stopped the job because the weekend was over. <laughs> so we don't know how long this rendered. They might be somewhere up there. We, I, I, I don't know. But basically, this line here is about 48 hours. Uh, and this has got to be somewhere around four hours. Um, and the red line is using standard, standard cycles, right? So uh, some of these frames, a lot of motion, they're unpredictably high. Some of them are actually reasonable, right? Just around four hours of frame. Um, but your average production manager would probably prefer having a flat line over here rather than having something that jumps up and down because it's just unpredictable, right? You send the frames off for a weekend, want to review them in the morning, and half of them didn't even show up. And instead, in using Embry, we get a much nicer profile, right? So this is maybe around 10 hours, may maybe bordering 14. I didn't do the exact math. Um, but it's just a lot more predictable, right? And so for, for the individual frame, some of them actually got slower, but overall, it's a lot of savings here. So the future of this, um, there's more things that I could support. Right now, it's just supporting the basic level of what cycles is already. Um, but there's more time, more memory, and more performance to be gained from, from supporting quad meshes directly. That could save just a quarter of memory right there. Um, and if it could handle subdivisions and displacements by itself, then we could save time not doing them in advance, but actually doing them when they're necessary, which is what Embry promises. Um, also, using the split kernel may or may not give a benefit using Embry. Um, it's hard to tell without trying it. And there's one or two little things that are slightly better in cycles than they are in Embry. And why not? It's open source. We're sharing. We're all friends. Take some cycles code, give them back to Embry so everybody else can use it. And the final project would be, of course, if we could use the same acceleration for the GPU, right? Anyone that has a scene that actually renders on a GPU because it fits in memory, but has motion blur, sure, why not have it 10 times faster? We'd be happy. 
So that was the one thing. We, we've had render time is a big problem, and in cases we've got it to be 10 times faster, um, sometimes equal, but a good chunk of savings right there. What's next? What is, what is your other problem you always have? Memory. So looking at that, um, again, a render log, it's 100 megs right there, and it's still loading textures, actually not started rendering yet. Where does all the memory go? It goes to your textures. Textures are huge these days. You have several material layers, you have albedo, roughness, material, normal everywhere, and your textures are at least 4K, right? If not 16K, and every pebble has a texture, and so you end up with tens of gigabytes. Um, now where do they go, right? You're, you're rendering a 4K image frame for a movie, so every single texture has more pixels than the resulting frame. Where do those pixels go? Well, most of them don't even show up on screen. They're behind the camera, they're somewhere to the right on top, or there's a huge texture and it shows up this big on screen. So instead of loading all the textures before rendering, we just load no texture before rendering. And instead, we just load the textures when we need them and what we need them. And we take a fixed size of memory, declare this to be our texture memory, and with a bit of optimization, we can save files to disk in a way that we can pick only a certain chunk out of it. And if we do map mapping, we also solve the problem that if you're looking at it this small, um, you don't have to go all over the file to, fix, uh, to find the individual pixels, but actually have all of them in one place. Now that is quite some work to actually figure out which pixel to pick when and where, at what size you see it on screen. So um, I'm not going to bother you with the full details, um, but we just have to trace the footprint of a ray. Basically, how big does the ray get through reflections and diffuse bounces? Sometimes it gets wider, sometimes it gets narrower. And for the actual management of the cache, loading the, t loading the files, evicting them, keep making sure you're not exceeding memory. It's also something already there, and there's a library called Im Open Image IO. And it turns out Cycles is already using it, just not for the texture cache, um, or at least not in an efficient way. There are some ways you could force it to use. Um, and so I just extended it based on that. And the texture cache in OpenMGL has been production tested. There's been a lot of Hollywood films already out that use it. So we know it's working. Any bug that's in there is my bug and not theirs. <laughs> and putting it into Cycles, just like before, it's just a little bit of UI. You can pick your texture size and set a few options that um, probably will stay on most of the time. And you can use a memory, right? Um, instead of loading tens of gigabytes of textures, you just tell it how much you want to use. I can tell it, well, use one gigabyte of memory, and that's it. And it'll just fill them up as needed and empty it out when there's old textures and you, new ones have to come in. It does slow down rendering, though. Uh, so we measured about 10%, depending on the cache size. If you use a really small cache size, you can double or triple your render time if you make it really large. It's almost the same. Um, it also requires you to pay some attention to your color space. Um, I think by now everyone is aware that color space is a topic. Um, but even more so, as soon as you do MIP mapping, um, setting the wrong color space becomes more apparent than before. So it turns out we're not actually using this attention in production at this moment. Um, it's just not at the point yet where I think it's complete enough, stable enough, reliable enough. And what I did not mention before about Embry is that switching to Embry, um, just like you saw in the agent scene where it went from 9 gigs to 6 gigs, um, equally the scenes went from 90 gigabytes to 60 gigabytes just by switching to Embry. So, so we, we also saved memory right there, and using texture caching just was not that important anymore. Still, it's something for the future, and we just need to figure out now how to do proper map maps for normal maps and displacements, where to put those files on the file system, just to make sure we actually have write permissions and we don't actually fill up your hard drive with useless textures all over the place, and there's always some more performance, performance tuning we could do. Um, Again, the CPU split kernel could help us maybe getting more better cache performance out of it. And everybody's always asking about a GPU, which, which will be really hard for texture caching, but I'm not ruling out that it's impossible. 
Now there's a third thing to talk about. The third thing um, it's more important than render time, and it's more important than saving memory. Who here wishes they had a 48-hour day? <laughs> User time, right? You can always buy another computer, you can always buy more memory, but you cannot clone your best animator, you cannot clone your best render wrangler. Those, those people in your, in your team, they're irreplaceable, and you want to make sure they use their time efficiently. So uh, we could improve this everywhere, right? Blender is good, but it's never perfect. You could always make things easier to use. And the one thing I was working on for this time is making compositing easier. <laughs> now, if you want to create a mat for a certain object, um, right now what you have is ID mats in, in Blender. So you give each object or material, you give it an ID number, and you get a false color image back that basically has this number for each pixel, telling you what object is on this pixel. But it's only one object. Most of the things that are on screen are actually more than one object. Either there's a border and you get anti-aliasing, or depth of field, you see a blurry image of one object and the one behind it. Motion blur has several objects in one place, and also transparency. And the ID passes also require some manual setup, right? You need to assign these numbers to these objects, and you need to keep a table of actually which number is which object, so you know it later on. Um, so you actually end up with large Excel sheets in production that is just numbers and names and numbers and names of objects. Um, turns out, again, I'm not the smart guy, somebody else at the work already. There's something called CryptoMat, which uses the name of the object or the, op or the material as an identifier, as opposed to a number. And it turns that into a little, little uh, hash, so it crunches it and saves it to a color channel. The coverage of how much that object uh, takes in a pixel is encoded to the next color channel. So just using regular RGBA, you can already store two layers of depth, um, so transparency layers or anti-aliasing. And if you, take, if you take three layers of RGBA data, you already have six layers of depth for compositing for any number of materials requiring no setup other than just you know, clicking the box. So you click this box, render the image, and you have your, your mats already set up. In the compositor, you have a new node where you take those extra layers and plug them in. And you can type your name of what you want to select. And I'm not sure if you can see it from the back, but I was typing window and lower intake. I actually see the lower intake being matted out and very transparent, very faintly, the window, because it's mostly transparent. Or, instead of actually typing the name, you have these color pickers, and you just pick something from a false color image. Uh, you click the body of a car, and you get the mat of the body of the car, including the little part that's behind the transparent window. And in action, I did a little video of how this looks like when you're actually using it. Um, so here's a little setup, um, a well-known scene, I think. Um, just rendered out with a simple crypto matte layer. And here's a little color correction being applied just to make sure you can see that I'm changing something. Um, so this is programmer art, it's nothing fancy. Um, this here is a false color image that you can use to actually pick objects from, from the scene with a color picker. And let's see if the video is playing. All right, just going quickly over it. And next I'm going to just type the name of the jacket. So the geometry name of the jacket. And then it's going to give us the color correction on the jacket. So typing the name. And here's the jacket. <laughs> Same thing again, typing the body, and here's the next one. I could just go in and type and delete, or I can actually use the color picker, pick the body, and it's gone. Same thing for this. Uh, this is, and now instead I decide, well, I want to have the, the blades of grass here, I click them. Here they are. I can add the rocks. 
said these are coming up next. Um, this one has a death of field on it. Uh, let's add in Frank the sheep. And because it's still live, we can actually edit and change the colors and everything. Uh, mind you, the limitation is still, the input is RGBA, right? It's not depth, it's not multiple layers. So the color correction applied to the sheep just takes the, the grass in front of it with it to a certain degree. So it's not deep compositing. But it's a significant improvement for just your single uh, layers, I think. So, and that concludes the three things I was supposed to present today. So, Emory is rendering faster in cycles. Open image I.O. in cycles uses a lot less memory. And CryptoMat makes compositing easier. And the bonus features that there's not just three cycles features, it's actually a new compositor node as well. Um, how far are these things from master? Um, <laughs> so I've talked to some people here. Uh, we're going to make branches for CryptoMat and Embry on Git Blender Orc. Um, Open image IO, I think, is just not ready yet for master at all. Uh, it's just more work to be done. But that doesn't mean we're keeping it from you. Um, source code is public. This is uh, the tangent internal repository. These are the branches for each feature based off of an older version of master. But they will move to Git Blender org really soon. All right, that's it. Thank you very much.